a lot of my coaching is all of a sudden then you know especially first lesson mm. is re-educating yeah. what a feedback loop is Welcome back to the channel guys, Kara Gray here today at Rygate Hill on this short game facility with one of the top short game coaches in the UK, if not the world, Alex Buckner. Alex, thanks for coming along. Thank you very much for coming. Today, we're gonna to be talking about how to improve your short game, but in a way that you've never thought about before. Let's get stuck in. We learn from mistakes as human beings. Brilliant. Do you make them in practice? Well, no, not really. I'm trying to be. Why? Yeah. At the end of the day, like the idea of a practice ground is to learn what to do out there. This is your revision phase. Do you know what I mean? That's the idea of the practice ground. Mm -hmm. So that revise what on earth you got wrong so you can go out there and make the correct analysis and answer to whatever the problem is that you are faced. This conversation is all based around how to improve your consistency around the greens and the answer to that is that there is no such thing as consistency consistency essentially has been defined as a concept or consistency is a concept that has been defined through time through ineffective practice players getting frustrated trying to find a solution but then not really sure where to look correct so would you say that the best way for players to practice to build what they perceive as consistency or what we would say as increase their performance so they're actually achieving the outcome that they desire yeah would be to become a master of variability mm -hmm. and treat every shot like they would out on course right but most importantly assess what happens after the shot that's the part i would probably focus on more in that sense assess after even if it's gone to three foot might be three foot right yeah. and it might be one foot long ask just ask why yeah. was it strike uh no i struck it struck it pretty good all right fine okay now did you let's say land it where you wanted to mm. yeah i did all right did you flight it the way you wanted to yeah that's exactly the flight that i wanted to did it react the way you wanted to regarding spin absolutely all right so you've hit the perfect intentional shot what was wrong you know what because of the rough like it's a little bit wet i just missed that part so it's sort of like you know just slid on me the, yeah, ball, the ball didn't spin whatever that might be so all of a sudden it just rolled on a touch more and you know what i thought it was going to bend a bit more right to left than that i just completely misread that whatever that might be okay or it might be a case of you know what i didn't mean to push it that much did i did i do that in my swing or did i do in my alignment let me just check that you know, the amount of people that don't work on line that's mental. But it's, it, it's, I just want to I just want to <laughs> add one tiny little thing to that. Right, is that um, we'll use someone on the range as an example. And if anyone watching this goes down to the range next time, I want you to watch every player hit one shot on that range, and watch the reaction from the player, and you'll be able to tell straight away if it's a good shot or a bad shot. But nearly every single player there, and I almost guarantee a hundred percent of players will go immediately after they miss strike a ball, get frustrated, grab another one, rake and pull and hit it, looking for the perfect outcome. And then when they do it, they try and hold on to that, which is the complete opposite sequence to what we're educating them here about today, Correct. which is when it's a, regardless if it's a good shot or a bad shot, having an understanding and that brings in the importance of routine and visualizing the shot and exactly knowing what should happen for that shot. Watching the shot to its completion, standing back and then reviewing it that one ball might take 10 balls relative to the amateur next to you yeah. but that would be an incredibly beneficial way for you to go about your practice a million percent yeah because yeah, at the end of the day i think just whoever has the best feedback loop <laughs> tends to improve better so that's, that's all it is but the problem is people don't understand how to feedback and i think that's half the reason why so many people come to short game and go i want a technician functional lesson you know they want a swing and then they turn around well let's say the f they might not want that and they turn around and go my short game's rubbish i have no idea why they're normally the two things i get through through the door and i think if you had a better feedback loop that just wouldn't happen yeah. 
So a lot of my coaching is all of a sudden then, you know, especially first lesson, is re-educating what a feedback loop is. Once that's installed, the players come back to me and go, I don't understand how to hit this shot from this line. I don't understand how to adapt to this. I don't understand how to hit this high one. It's coming out of the toe for some reason. You got any idea why? Whatever that might be. But they're relevant questions that are basically geared towards a problem that they've had out on course that they've answered the question wrong and they want to understand how to answer it right next time. You basically teach shots. That's effectively what we need to do. Not a safe. Well, if you just get the club here, you'll be fine. Because you won't be. (laughs) Mate, that's incredible information. That's going to help a lot of golfers, right? It's going to start to shift their mindset around what they actually need to do with their short game because there's so many players out there who have struggled on specific shots probably their whole life. Yeah. Right? But they've been practicing the same way, putting that bucket of balls down, trying to work perfect technique, and they would have never considered at that time and place of actually just observing where the club is striking the ground every single time. And instead of changing their posture because they read in a magazine of thinking that's going to be the answer or the solution, yeah. then for that player, and it's all relative to your skill level and the expectation, sometimes if they just want to get it on the green, and they don't really practice, and this is the one pain point that they have, and their whole golf happiness is wrapped up in this shot, yeah. and they keep hitting behind every single time. Essentially, what they could do is observe where the club is striking the ground, right? And have some rehearsal swings and going, okay, it's hitting back there every single time. Now, why would I step in and then try and get the bottom of the swing over there? Where my natural pattern or action, sure, it might not produce the best shot all the time, but if this is a player that just wants to get the ball in green and one, rather than chopping into the ground and everything else considered, they would have a greater likelihood of then going, well, if it's hitting there every single time, maybe I just need to change my body a little bit to put it into a position. Might not be the perfect shot, but if that's their necessity outcome that they're looking for to achieve gratification out of their game of golf at a very base level, striking the ball and getting it on the green and one rather than duffing and blading over the top, well, that right there, that observation, that's something that anyone can take home. Yeah. And I, guess, I guess that would be bad now if there's quick fix. Yeah. Right? I mean, if you're getting better, I would say it's all right. So then from that, right, we've built this idea that there is a huge benefit for a lot of players uh, reframing the way that they think about success when it comes to around the green or just playing golf in general. Yeah. Um, we've then had a discussion around consistency and what that looks like or the lack of and yeah. the reason that in golf other than when the ball's teed up right you're not really playing the ball ever from the same surface mm-hmm. right because even putts are different lengths and different grains and all the yeah, other yeah, variables course, there yeah. now if a player wanted to let's say they had 20 minutes right and they wanted to work on three key skills or games right where they're going through a process of uh, the initial stage of looking at the shop, visualizing, getting an understanding of what they want to achieve, executing, and then assessing, right? What would those three be? And then I think this would be great for the guys to see of what would actually be some tangible practical advice that they could take straight to the range and actually get the most out of their time, okay? okay? With a large return on investment. Fine. All right. What would that so be? let's talk about maybe hitting some different extremes. Right, and what that might look like, playing on them scales, as well as then, like you said, you know, building a better feedback tool. Um, should we do the extremes first? Yeah, right, that sounds sort of fun. makes sense. That's fun, right? <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm going to just put you through, and you're going to have to roll with me here just a little bit. All right, this is mad, but um, we'll go through maybe the less mad one first. All right. So I like you to hit five slices and five hooks. All right, just as best you can, and whatever the next one is, I want it more extreme. Okay. All right. In a pitch shot, which is going... Just on the green. Okay. Try and take the flag out of the equation. Yeah. You're just purely looking at flight. How would you hit the most hookiest shot in the world? Okay. Want to start with hook? Yeah, let's go hook. And I'm trying to hook every single ball? Yeah. As more and more as possible. More and more. So my baseline, the first shot I start with is as big a hook as I can do. Correct. And then I'm trying to do it more and more and more. Yeah. Oh boy. So I'm trying to hit a big hook. Yeah. Start line doesn't matter. Not really. Outcome doesn't matter. No. Nope. Fairway's in danger if I... You're fine. No one's watching apart from just everyone watching, All right. watching this so video. So, the biggest hook possible. Now, for me to hit a hook, this is based on my feel, mm-hmm. um, the face needs to be considerably close to the path. The less loft I have, 
that is going to encourage that ball to curve more if I'm hitting a full shot. Right? Yeah. Now you're an expert short game coach, yeah. so the variables here might be slightly different. Nope. Um, golf, golf is golf. Great, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> Just covering my bases there. <laughs> Not claiming to be an expert. Yep. And then from there, uh, I would try and get a uh, very shallow delivery. So I'm going to go a shallow delivery with a very closed face to path ratio. Okay, good. Okay. So you've now, got the idea? Yeah. So that's the first one. Perfect. Okay. Now, it's amazing how you're set up. Mm -hmm. I would never, ever normally get someone to do that on the first ball. Okay. Reason being, <laughs> that just doesn't come to mind to them. You're a bit more, I would put it, more well knowledge than most. <laughs> I would feed them into something like that yeah. at the very end because they would normally turn around and just be so like that. Exactly. <laughs> and that's why I would normally say more and more yeah. because no one would stand where you got to. And I would normally go, right, how do you get it more? How do you get it more? And just keep on pushing them. So, for your purpose, let's go. Let's do it in stages. Okay, so let's go. Bit of a draw. I will most people increase would say. the level of curvature. Yeah. So if I'm hitting a bit of a draw, let's say we're just that is our relative straight line. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get, and we're not talking specifics about start line. We'll be quite general here. The face needs to be closed to the path. Okay, so I'll hit a little bit of a draw. Pretty good. Pretty good. And I'll tell you what, that would be normally most people's extremes. That's mental, right? Okay. But go on, keep on going. The, the hard thing to hear is to manage the speed. Okay. That's a good point, right? So this is what you've learned about it. That's quite something. All right, one more. The reason I'm playing on tour has got to do with the next part on there. Okay. Not here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, unbelievable. Okay, so the first thing you came out with was managing the speed. Right, now we need to slice it. So for slicing, the way that I would go about it, this is fun. See, I need to practice more like this. Not that I practice anyway, but I'm enjoying this. Usually yeah. with my little bit of practice is demonstrating just usually flights yeah, right, yeah. and delivery. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm just channeling all my all my work that I did as a kid. Yeah, and of course you are. what we used to do. Of course you are. How much can you hook the ball? Yeah, right? well, if, if that kid's unbelievable, we need to understand why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> my brain's thinking, I'm like, okay, how do I deal off this, right? What's going to increase the amount of spin without getting too much of a descending blow? Would you, would you, would you deal off it in order to slice it? <sighs> are we trying to, like, are we just looking straight curvature? We're doing like as much of a slice as possible. Okay, so instantly my brain goes with like a 54. If I had like a 7 iron and I was trying to slice it, because of the amount of deflection, right, which is going for me to add a spin loft or loft of the ball, I would then try to de-loft it slightly in my setup because I know that would neutralize the ball flight a bit. But for a short game shot, I'm trying to think about how do I do that? I and mean, maybe I'm thinking relating it too much to a full shot. Well, no, no, you're, you're right, but you're talking about a fade here. Yeah. I'm talking about like a, a slice that hits the motorway and ends up in a different county. Actually, I know exactly how to do it. Right, so now you're in a very different setup. <laughs> yeah, now I know exactly how to do it. Now I know exactly how to do it. And for the purpose of... All of a sudden, the ball position is completely changed. Yeah. The shaft is completely changed. Yeah. How the face angle has changed. Yeah. Just from that conversation. Am I still trying to hit a good shot here? <laughs> or can I do this however I like? However you like. However I like. And I've got to slice it as much as I can. Slice as much as you can. Okay, so what I'm thinking of is I'm going to blade it. Okay, all right. Let's... Is that thinking outside the box that's too much? Out, that's almost too outside the box. Because that would get the most amount of yeah. slices. Yeah, with still a decent strike. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's wipe that in there. Always try and find an angle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> got, to, got to get another angle, absolutely. All right, so... All right. Go on, then. let's see it. Yeah. So we'll try and fade it. Pretty decent. Right, go on, and even more. I reckon you can go way outside on the back swing now. Oh yeah. But it's amazing how this is the, you draw the ball? Me? Yeah. Uh, relatively straight with my driver, if not a fade, and definitely, like when I'm playing well, I draw, okay. but the f pattern that I see when I'm playing is always a fade. Okay. Always a fade. Fine. But there's a lot of context and history behind that. Yeah, so yeah, of course. It's not necessarily just technical. Decent. 
All right, one more. This is hard work. <laughs> this is good. Okay, so now the most. Oh, very decent. There we go. Right. Last one, I reduced um, wrist hinge. Okay. Fine neutral. Okay. What do you notice between the hook, the slice, and the neutral? For this shot, it was far more beneficial to have a slicing action. Fine, because it's short-sided. Correct. Correct. So if you're going to a short-sided flag, don't be hook bias. It's going to make life tougher. Think of that scale. Think of it relevant to whatever the shot is. If you're too draw bias in a short in a short-sided scenario, you're making life very tough. All right. Same again if you're fade biased in that sense or slice biased to a, let's say a long side of flag and you want the ball to run, you're going to have a hard time and you have to basically go way down and loft to be able to even achieve that. That's not saying it's not achievable. I'm just saying the fact that your average bit, the same as that whole plus and minus conversation, too many minuses when you want way too many more pluses in that sense. And, uh, you know, look at then obviously the ball speed, one comes out hotter, one comes out way softer. One has more roll, one has more potential to stop. Now, if you're struggling with, say, too much of a hot ball speed, could it be you're too much on the draw side? It's only a possibility. That might not be true, but it's a possibility. Now, the thing is, though, the fact that you can access one side to the other and then also find the middle, you can start then going, well, I want to be a little bit more of this in this situation. I want to be a little bit more of this in this situation. The idea is to be able to understand how you can sort of tip on one scale into the other and use it to your advantage. As much as this is fun, it's incredibly useful. I'm going to make mention to, to something that maybe... I would say better players have probably heard of that, right? Uh, throughout their life of when they tried to make swing changes, echoed through no matter what coach they've had, at some conversation, at some stage, there would have been a conversation around exaggeration when they're working on a change in their swing. In their yeah. Motion. And the coach would say, exaggerate, exaggerate, exaggerate. I am exaggerating. They look at it on film, it's not exaggerated at all. Yeah. But the beautiful thing I like about this, it's got nothing to do with feedback externally in regards to a mirror or a camera it's got everything based on an evaluation of the end product correct flight now from that any golfer can go out and experiment a hook and a slice and the middle and when i am teaching shot shaping in exhibitions and clinics and that sort of thing and everyone gets worked up on trying to figure out and they ask me all these technical questions about where should my feet be shoulders and i said the ball only cares about one thing, right? What happens at that moment of impact and the way that the club is delivered in regards to the path at the moment of impact, the face, and the delivery of the loft, correct? Yeah. So, of that, these guys would have seen some of the extremes that I set up. Yeah, I mean, they were as extreme as I've ever seen. They were, they were awesome. Yeah, yeah. But I suppose that goes in the coaching principles, right? Is that I know these things because when I'm teaching these to players, yeah. I go, you can have one look at the player, right? And go, I want you to hook that ball. If it was anyone, I'd never seen them. They all look dressed exactly the same. And I say, hit the biggest hook you can. Instantly, you'd be able to determine what level of ball striker they would be. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, same with the slice. So running them through a three ball test, hook it as much as you can, slice it as much as you can, hit a straight shot. Well, that's something any golfer of any level can do. Measure themselves against which one they're competent at and which one they're not, and then find the middle ground and improve. And at least it just gives them awareness of maybe what tendency they would have. And the best example that nearly every golfer would know is when Tiger would just be on the range doing the nine ball flight drill. Yeah. And he would go through those ball flights and when he couldn't do it, he would evaluate and he would go through with his coach. Now that is excellent coaching. You hardly ever see that anymore. No. Yeah. It's a shame. So what we did is we just did the, the Buckner three ball drill. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you think of it like that, it's just, you say, one end of the sail to the other, find the middle, but then understanding the little bits and bobs you did to reach the end. So if you wanted then it to be slightly, you know, a bit more of a colder outcome versus a hotter one, slightly higher, slightly, you know, whatever that might be. How did I go from over there somewhere to then here and I need to just move here? which part do I do a little bit more of? Just experiment. Until you get the flight, you all know how to do the other end, so you obviously know how to do it. Just 
dial it back and you can just start then dialing a little bit more and more and more and understanding therefore when to use it but that's a great way of understanding one end to the other finding the middle then expanding on that and then building relevance to a situation. Mm -hmm.